We are continuing this morning in our consideration of the book of Isaiah and the increase of the kingdom of God, both in Isaiah's time and in our own. And we are in chapter 10, continuing in chapter 10, having begun uh, chapter 10 last Sunday, we will bring chapter 10 to a conclusion. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn there with me. Our focus will be predominantly, if not exclusively, on verses 20 through 27, though we will read through the end of the chapter in verse 34. Uh, I wouldn't want anybody to ever suggest that we didn't preach all of Isaiah, and so I'm not going to skip reading that portion of it, even though our focus will be on the upper part of our uh, of uh, of chapter 10 here. And so if you have your Bibles, please uh, feel free to turn with me, and I'd like to invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness. The Lord God of hosts will make a full end as decreed in the midst of all the earth. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, Be not afraid of the Assyrians when they strike with the rod and lift up their staff against you as the Egyptians did. For in a very little while my fury will come to an end and my anger will be directed at their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will wield against them a whip. And when he struck Midian at the rock of Oreb, and his staff will be over the sea and he will lift it as he did in Egypt. And in that day his burden will depart from your shoulder And his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be broken because of the fat. He has come to Ayath. He has passed through Migron. At Michmash, he stores his baggage. They have crossed over the pass. At Geba, they lodge for the night. Ramah trembles. Gibeah of Saul has fled. Cry aloud, O daughter of Gilim. Give attention to Lashish, O poor Anathoth. Madmena is in flight. The inhabitants of Gibbam flee for safety. This very day he will halt at Nob. He will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold, the Lord God of hosts will lop the bows with terrifying power. The great and heavy, uh, the great in height will be hewn down, and the lofty will be brought low. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with an axe. And Lebanon will fall by the majestic one. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word. We are grateful that it is inspired, it is breathed out, it is given for our benefit. That we might receive it in truth, that we might cherish it in truth, that we might live by it. And so Lord, help us now as we give our attention to your word and to the preaching of your word. Lord, may the preaching of your word have its power and effect in our lives. May it be firmly established in us. Having been established in us, Lord, may it shape us and make us who you've called us to be. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The reasons to read poetry take longer to articulate. The most persuasive, if one is willing to entertain it, is that reading and writing poetry are survival skills. If we learn the skills involved in reading closely, attentively, imaginatively, if we understand the demands of a poem and respond to them, We are better equipped to negotiate flexibly, distinguish what is authentic from what is false, and make discerning decisions. But poetry's demands are complex. Poems demand that we slow down, notice 
patterns. Reckon with ambiguities. Consider subtle distinctions between one term or image and its alternative. And recognize the relationship between techniques and purposes. But if we take this work on, if we practice finding paths through poems, staying with them as we tease out their possibilities, follow where they point us by illusion and suggestion, and unpack their metaphors, they can equip us to walk into any situation, look around, assess, analyze, and act. They teach us to listen more attentively to language and to reckon more astutely with the arts of persuasion. More than that, they restore to us what I believe the noise and haste of commercial culture dull and destroy. Being attuned to subtleties of sense and feeling, being awake to the possibilities of an ordinary moment on an ordinary day, they train and exercise our imagination. Trained imaginations are what we need most at a time like this. That was an excerpt from Marilyn McIntyre's excellent book, Caring for Words in a Culture of Lies. I was uh, informed of this book by my favorite resource, uh, the Mars Hill Audio Journal. I had an opportunity to hear uh, an interview with uh, Marilyn McIntyre and Kevin Myers, who is the uh, editor of uh, Mars Hill. It was a fantastic uh, book. I read it a number of years ago, and uh, recently I pulled it back out and was thumbing through some of the sections of it, and I actually read this portion that I read to you this morning. I shared it with our staff a few weeks ago because I wanted to suggest to them that the work that we are called to do as uh, staff members and as those who have responsibility uh, on the staff, which is always pastoral. I'm the pastor on the staff, but the staff shares with me in the past pastoral intent and the pastoral responsibilities along with the session and helping to care for our church. And so I suggested to the staff that people are poems. And I read that same passion, uh, excuse me, passage to uh, the staff and every time McIntyre made reference to poetry or poem, I just substituted people and it worked out perfectly. Because people are complex, people are ambiguous, people are not always easy to read and to understand, and so you have to work with them, and you have to work closely with them in order to understand who they are and what they're saying and what they're doing. And so I have found this uh, passage to be invaluable to me, and I hope to our staff and and to all those who are serving on the session, if you heard that passage, it is helpful for us to consider people as poems. But I'm suggesting it to you today because we live in a time in the world in which we need a poetic imagination. Poetic imagination is something that reading poems helps to develop and to nurture in us. A poetic imagination is an imagination that is able to see things. Not just make things up. Sometimes we think that imagination means uh, making things up uh, out of nothing in our own minds. And there's, a, there's an aspect of that when it comes to an imagination, particularly a child's imagination... But a poetic imagination is is an issue of discernment. It's an issue of vision. It's the ability to see. McIntyre commends our vision and our sight by working with poems. We are called to discern things. A poetic imagination allows us to discern the authentic from the false. A poetic imagination requires that we slow things down, wrestle, with complexity, ambiguity, and to realize that the answers are not always so simple. A poetic imagination calls us to attend to things closely, to have a close reading of the text, to have a close reading of people, to have a close reading of a situation. 
A a poetic imagination trains us to know, to gain knowledge, to understand the truth, and to know how to act, to know where to go, and to know what to do. Now, why am I sharing this all with you? This is not a, a literature class or lecture. No, this is preaching. I'm sharing this with you because what I want to suggest to you this morning is that the poetic imagination is essentially the same thing as the prophetic imagination. We may not all be interested in poems. We may not all be interested in literature. But as Christians, we should all be interested in the Word of God. And we should be interested in our neighbors who are like poems. And so we need a prophetic imagination, especially when we come to our text. We've been working with Isaiah for uh, close to a year now. It is an entire work of prophecy. And so in order for us to understand what it is that God is calling us to and communicating with us, we must cultivate a prophetic imagination. Now you might be saying, Nate, we're a year into it and you're just telling us this. I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry it's coming later, but we still got a lot of chapters ahead of us in Isaiah, and so it's never too late to begin to develop this prophetic imagination. But I want to share this with you not only because of our time in Isaiah, but because of our text in particular this morning. Because when we read the text and we come to the big idea, as I read our text for this morning, the question that is being raised by our text is this. What does it mean to be a remnant people of God? That is what Isaiah is asking. That is what God is communicating. And in order for us to answer this question, in order for us to receive what God has for us from this text, and to answer the question, what does it mean to be a remnant people, we must cultivate a prophetic imagination. I love the end of the book of Revelation that says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And When we come to the text this morning, I want to see Jesus And I want to hear Jesus. And I want to know what Jesus is calling his church to do and to be. And Jesus is speaking to us today about being a remnant people. You see, God is sifting through Judah. God is making Judah smaller. Ahaz is... Not, uh, he is not willing to trust in the Lord. He's not willing to ask for a sign. Remember, all of this is on the heels of Isaiah chapter 7. All of this is on the heels of Isaiah coming to Ahaz and saying, I understand the Assyrians are in the north. I understand that they're knocking on the door, but God is offering you a gift. He's asking you to trust in him. If you will establish yourself in faith, you will be firmly established by God. He refuses to do so, and so God begins begins a program of uh, discipleship or discipline. And that discipline is a sifting through of Judah. And so Judah is becoming smaller. And so Judah is asking, what does it mean for us to be a remnant people? And such punishment, such discipleship, such justice is not simply an academic principle. Our text is not just interesting to read. It's not a piece of historical data. It's not there for our enjoyment and our consideration. No, it would appear that God is perhaps still producing remnants and working with remnants as part of his dealings with the church in the world today. And so the church must ask the question, What does it mean to be a remnant people of God? And we must have a prophetic imagination if we're going to answer that. Now you might be saying, well, how do you know, Nate? How do you know that the church is becoming a remnant people of God? Well, I'll say two things. One, I just know. 
But second of all, for those who are helped by such things, we actually have data. It's data that I don't place all of my trust and hope in, but I don't think it's anything that we can simply ignore. We have sociological data to suggest that the church in America is increasingly becoming a remnant. Much of it is dying and will not come back. But some of it is a remnant. This year, the faith communities today uh, presented its 20 years of congregational change, the 2020 edition uh, that it puts out every year. Uh, faith Communities Today has put out a report and a survey uh, entitled 20 Years of Congregational Change, the 2020 Faith Communities Today Overview. Faith Communities Today is a multi-religious and collaborative research initiative that has been tracking trends in the U.S. religious landscape since the year 2000. And I don't believe in coincidences. I was working with this text when I received an email that told me, informed me, that this survey came out. And so I was interested in looking at the survey. And the information that is contained in the survey is quite sobering. This report is a first glimpse of the largest ever congregational survey of 15,278 religious communities from 80 different denominations and faith traditions. The recent survey conducted in 2020 is a continuation of 20 years of research that began in the year 2000. So it's a longitudinal study that began in the year 2000 and they've been tracking it for 20 years. The survey tracks trends that raise concerns and present challenges for a church that is seeking to not only survive, but thrive and flourish. While the survey's perspective doesn't paint a uniformly discouraging picture, there are some pockets of hope. The overall aggregate portrayal of the data, according to the survey, is, quote, not very optimistic. The study shows that America's congregations are predominantly small. This is true as a whole for the country. And that a majority of those churches, these small churches, are simply getting smaller and rapidly. In the past 20 years of this survey's effort, the median attendance size has decreased over those 20 years by 50%. The median attendance of the local church has decreased over 20 years, by 50%. In 20, or year 2000, the median attendance in a church in America was 137 people. Today, it is 65 in weekly attendance and worship. Now, before the pandemic, nearly two-thirds, 65% of congregations had a weekly worship attendance of less than 100 people. It was around 100 was the average. It used to be there was a good rule of thumb that the average uh, church size was around 120. That's what pastors would say. That would track with what their data was saying, 137. You'd say around 120 people was the average church size in America. Before the pandemic, it was down to about 100. But now at least half of the churches surveyed in the country from the pandemic just 18 months ago is down to 65. 65 or fewer people in attendance on any given weekend. And early indications, according to the survey, suggest that the trend will likely accelerate over the next decade. Shrinking attendance figures coupled with an increase in the number and percent of small congregations indicates that a good many of congregations are simply not growing. They're contracting. They're slipping away. The median rate of change, for those who are statisticians and enjoy this kind of information, the median rate of change between 2015 and 2020 was a negative 7% over five years, meaning half of all congregations declined in attendance by at least 7%. The study goes on to say that this is the first time in 20 years of surveys that the median five-year rate of change in attendance was negative. 
Lights are going out. Churches are dying. There are several reasons for that, many of which I can't go into this morning. And I have, there are, there's the sociological reasons that are shared in the survey, but there's only so much we can get from uh, the sociologists. There's a theological issue here as well. And there's reasons to have op- uh, optimism and hope. The survey uh, did go on to indicate that there are signs of growth and revitalization in churches in America, and it lists a number of those things that, uh, are con- uh, that are in keeping with health and vitality. One is a clear vision and mission, which is why I'm so glad that we have our whole mission and vision blueprint, our whole identity as a church can be summarized very quickly and very easily as a church that is gathered by his love for us. And we are scattered by our love for him. The only other mission statement that I've heard that I like almost as much as ours is all of Christ for all of life. Those who have a very clear mission and vision or purpose, those who have a very clear understanding of why we exist, we exist to be the gathered people of God and we exist to take the good news of Jesus out from this place and to share it with our neighbors. That is why we exist. And churches that have a clear mission, a clear purpose, are churches that are vital. According to the survey, churches that are vital are those who have vibrant worship. What I found interesting is that this is not uh, um, cor- correlative to contemporary worship, which has been our assumption for so many years. They have a kind of an interesting statement in the survey that says, none of this growth is attached to electric guitars. In fact, traditional worship is going up, which I find interesting. But it's not a matter of contemporary versus traditional. They say it's a matter of vibrant worship, life-giving worship, worship where you sense and recognize that the Spirit of God is present. And another sign of health and vitality is innovation and openness to change. Churches that say, this is how we've always done it, are going down into the grave. There's a certain necessity to be able to pivot. Now, I'm somebody who understands and and believes and holds on to the capital T tradition. I don't think innovation for innovation's sake is worth anything. But we also can't be stuck. To be stuck and unwilling to pivot is to die. And so innovation and willingness to change, a clear mission and vision, vibrant worship, these are all important things to have in order to be a life-giving and growing church. But none of those things, as sociologically important as they might be, are as important or as necessary as having a prophetic imagination. We must have a prophetic imagination because we are faced with the question, what does it mean to be a remnant people of God? The church is not blowing up across the country. It's contracting. God is sifting through the church. And we have a decision. We can either be a dying church or a remnant church. They are not the same thing. A dying church is not the same thing as a remnant church. And in order to be a remnant church and not a dying church, we need a prophetic imagination. A prophetic imagination for the remnant people of God. And so if you have your Bibles, keep them open. And let's consider closely verses 20 through 27. Because it is here that God is... Uh, using the text to shape a prophetic imagination among his people. These verses must be read poetically and prophetically in order to inform our imagination so that we might be the remnant people of God. And so look at verse 20. What does God say is consistent with with a remnant people. What does it mean to be the remnant people of God? How must we see things? First, in verse 20, a remnant people are separated from lies and idols in order to be fully welded back to God in truth. What does Isaiah say? The day, in that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of God will no more lean on him who struck them, 
meaning Assyria, hoping in the power of Assyria, where Ahaz is hoping to create some kind of alliance with Assyria. He's trusting in Assyria. They will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. Remember Isaiah chapter 1 through 6, God is dealing with the idolatry in the kingdom. In chapter 7 through 12, the idols of the kingdom are being displaced by Emmanuel, God, who is with his people. And for a remnant people to be a remnant people and not a dying population, they must be willing to be separated from lies and separated from the idols in order to be fully welded back to God. I remember when I was at um, Geneva College and I had the opportunity to study under uh, Dr. Byron Batar. I understand we got another Geneva graduate in the back. Is that right? You Geneva grad. You remember Dr. Batar? Dr. Batar had a wonderful insight that he said almost in passing. He was talking about true religion. Sometimes when discussions about religion come up, Christians, particularly evangelical Christians, go, well, what are you talking about? Religion. That could mean almost anything. And it can, and it does oftentimes. But the word religion got rehabilitated in my vocabulary when Dr. Batar shared with me that religion is really what we all want. We have to pay close attention to the words. We need a poetic and a prophetic imagination. Religion is a compound word, re legare. Re meaning back, where we get the word return. And legare means to weld, to weld. Like a welder taking two pieces of metal and bringing them back together so that that joint is solid and the two pieces are no longer separated. True religion is to be welded back to God. And that can only happen if we are first separated from the, from the lies, separated from the idols. To be a remnant people of God, we cannot hold on to these other things if we are going to walk in true religion where we are welded back to the Lord. To the extent that we hold on to these other things, as a remnant people of God, as the church, we will die. Will be a statistic. But if we're going to be the remnant people of God, we must be welded back. Verse 21, a remnant people of God will endure destruction that overflows with righteousness. Now that doesn't sound too hopeful. But we're going to look at this with some detail in just a minute. Destruction, if we pay close attention to the words, means simply being used up. Destruction is like a a, a fire that uses up all of the wood. It's exhausted. It is a necessary ending. Destruction is to be finished. The same word is used in the Old Testament when it is described, when it is shared, that the building of the temple had come to its completion. The temple wasn't destroyed, it was finished being built. God is bringing things to an end. The time has come to end this kind of life. To the extent that we hold on to the idols, we are dying. It is coming to an end. Destruction is decreed that produces righteousness, overflowing with righteousness, meaning a fuller conformity and integration with God's kingdom. If we want to be a remnant people of God, we must be destroyed. Certain things have to come to an end in order that other things might bubble up and overflow. We need an imagination to see that. In verses 23 through 26, in a remnant, the catastrophic is overcome by faith in the improbable. I put it that way for a reason. It's not meant to be uh, difficult to understand. But let me say it again. In a remnant, the catastrophic is overcome by faith in the improbable. Just this past Wednesday at our congregational meeting, we were discussing what would happen in a catastrophic event in the church. And where would our leadership be in order to see us through that catastrophe? Well, I find it interesting that God's word answers that question for us. We as a church 
what are we called to put our trust in? Numbers? God is making things small. A remnant people. And he's saying, don't trust in the numbers. Trust in the improbable. There's a reference to the parting of the Red Sea. There's a reference to Egypt, where Israel is standing there at the edge of the Red Sea. The great horde of Egypt is thundering down with chariots. There's nowhere to go. It's a catastrophe beyond the greatest catastrophe that you can imagine. And God takes one man and one staff and he parts the sea and the people of God walk through on dry land. It is an improbable salvation. But God secures it for his people. The remnant people of God are called to faith in the improbable. There's a reference not only to Egypt, but there's a reference to Gideon, who won a great victory over the Midianites. And who was Gideon? Do we remember? He's the one who was called to be the general of Israel's armies. And God kept saying, you got too many people. You got too many people. Take them away. Take them away. Whittle it down. Whittle it down. And then God secures a great victory with a small number. A dying church will look at the numbers and go, oh no. A remnant people will say, God is powerful and strong and faithful. And he will make a way. We are called to have such an imagination. Verse 27, God says that a faithful remnant are given a vision of rest from all their labors and striving. Judah has had a heavy reliance on the idols. And a church that is dying oftentimes has a heavy reliance on methods and methodologies of the world, sociology and technology, and a desire to build an empire. But God is done with building empires. He's done with being missional. Missional must give way to being faithful. A faithful remnant results in rest. Rest and restoration to the land, to the full possession of the promise of God. This is the imagination that God wants His church to have. He wants us to develop a prophetic imagination as a remnant people, to be separated from the idols to have things come to an end in order that righteousness might flow, to have faith and trust in Him and in the improbable, to have rest from all of our labors and strivings to try to become something, to make ourselves something, in order that we might have full possession of the land. In these remnant times, the church must take up such a prophetic imagination. I want to explore just one of these features a little bit more closely with you this morning. We must have a prophetic imagination. And in the text that we read for this morning, there was one sentence that seemed to me more poetic than all the, all the rest. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness. What in the world are you talking about, Lord? We have to stick with it. We have to stay with the text. We have to slow things down and try to understand what it is that God is calling us to. You see, these two ideas seem to be contradictory, but they're right next to each other, side by side. Destruction? Righteousness? How do those two things work together? And why in the world would you decree destruction, and how through destruction can righteousness even come about? I was captivated by this text this week, and I think God wants us to be captivated as we consider what it means to be the remnant people of God. God is bringing something to an end. Destruction is decreed in order that something else might flourish and overflow. In our text, 
This morning, in the life of Isaiah and in Judah, God is bringing idolatry to an end in order that righteousness might overflow. God is bringing earthly empire building to an end in order that the kingdom of God might overflow. God is bringing church growth to an end. God is bringing church growth to an end. In order that the people of God might be formed in Christ. That is what's happening right now. That is what we are seeing in our world and in the church in America. How can I say this? I say this because God has promised it. God has decreed it. The spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Christ. And Christ's desire is to bring certain things to an end in order that his righteousness might overflow. You see, the word righteous, it means something. It means to be made straight. The world is bent. Our hearts are bent. We're only and always and continually seeking to Bring things in here toward ourselves, toward our own gratification, toward our own desires. We are bent. And God is calling us to be made straight in order that our love and our desire and our affections might be made toward him. God wants an overflowing of righteousness. God wants us to be conformed to him, made straight, conformed to his kingdom. To be righteous is to be formed by God, to be conformed to God, to be transformed by God. God desires Christians to be formed. Righteousness is to be in spiritual shape. Strong spiritual shape. God is chiseling things away in order to bring it into shape. Chiseled not in body, but in soul. Righteousness is health and strength. God is producing strength in a remnant people. God desires his church to be strong, not dying, but to be concentrated and strong. God calls his church to be strong, not arrogant, not inflexible, not brutish, not brash, not loud, not rude, but strong in accord with his son, Emmanuel, who is with us. Righteousness is strength that takes on responsibility. God wants his church to take on responsibility. He's calling us to righteousness and to a strength that takes things on. Strength is the joyful assumption of kingdom responsibilities. God is calling his church to leadership in these remnant days as God is bringing concentration to his church. He wants his church to lead in strength. Just as Jesus said, just as Isaiah said, here I am, Lord. Take me. Here I am. Send me. Righteousness is strength that serves others, that seeks the good of others, even sacrificially, even as Jesus gave his life on the cross as he served others. Righteousness is strength that resists the wrong things. As the world is always inviting us to take up into our hands The things of power in this world. God is saying resist them. Even as Jesus resisted those things in the the desert. Ours is a time of resistance training. In order that the church might be made strong. Righteousness is strength that asserts the right things. Not as we define them. But as God defines them. When Jesus said not my will but your will be done. God is calling a remnant people in the church to strength. Righteousness is strength that prioritizes worship. Not the idols, but 
the Lord Jesus Christ who is with us. Righteousness is strength that is virile. God wants his church to have virility. To be a virile church is to replicate according to one's look. We all have children, or many of us have children. We all see the children here. And what's the feature that we see among the children? They look a little bit like their parents. To be a remnant church is not to have a race down to the bottom. There's there's no glory. There's no righteousness in just being small. God wants us to be strong in order that we might replicate according to our kind. God wants us to build. But he wants us to build in strength. See, I believe that God has given me a comforting ministry. A comforting ministry in remnant times. Now you might be thinking, well, Nate, I don't find you to be very comforting, particularly now. But I want us to stick with the word. I want us to pay close attention to the words. What does comforting mean? Come. Fortis. With. Strength. Fortissimo. Fortified. God has called me to such a time as this that I might bring comfort to the church. That I might gather around young men and young women, young families, and to comfort them, to instill strength into them, to see them fortified in order that we might be the church that Christ died in order that we might become. Not that we just watch ourselves dwindle away. No, that we might be concentrated, that we might be strong, that we might assert ourselves in the world in a loving way that sees the kingdom of God advance from this place. God has called me to a comfort ministry and he has called you to be strong. You see, God values strength. And so he's bringing the church into a time Remnant. Not dying. Remnant. You have to have an imagination to see it. If you don't have a prophetic imagination, you'll look around and you'll say, all is lost. Everything is dying. No. God has called us to be strong. In these unholy days... These days in which God is sifting through the church, he is calling us to be strong and to lend our strength to the next generation. Will you join me in this comforting ministry? Will you join me in comforting the next generation and spending your strength for them? Would you stand with me as we pray? Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love and for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be strong. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be the people of God, not dying on the vine, but concentrating, seeing our strength concentrated in order that we might be the people who resist the world but assert the kingdom of God serving our neighbors, loving sacrificially, taking on responsibility in order to see the church thrive, in order to see your kingdom advance. And so, Lord, we hear all the children in the sanctuary today, and we rejoice in that because with every cry, with every noise, we hear opportunity. Opportunity to invest. Opportunity to love opportunity to minister comfort and to see your church strong. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.